The interesting feature of these incremental, unexpected, mishaps of the last year is that they are likely to intensify and complicate the last phase of our current market downturn. The first phase of an extreme bubble breaking is in Grantham's opinion almost certain, and rightly or wrongly that was how he saw the 2000 and 2007 breaks in their first phases. To prick these bubbles all you have to do is have investors question whether their nearly perfect economic and financial conditions can, indeed be extrapolated forever. Almost any pin can prick such supreme confidence and cause the first quick and severe decline. They are just accidents waiting to happen, the very opposite of unexpected. But after a few spectacular bear market rallies we are now approaching the far less reliable and more complicated final phase. At this stage housing markets, which are always slower to react, have not fully rolled over yet, neither has the economy gone into recession, nor have corporate profits yet been severely hit. The length and depth of continued market decline from here depends on how precisely the deterioration from perfect conditions will play out. War in Ukraine is not straightforward to say the least. Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus play big roles in grain and oilseed and even bigger and more dangerous roles in fertilizer. The unsettling of geopolitics that the invasion caused, and the near impossibility of calculating the follow-on effect of limiting Europe's energy, not to mention risks resulting from the price and availability of food and energy in some vulnerable developing countries, all contribute to a rare level of uncertainty. Some of these uncertainties might resolve into pleasant surprises and so there might be an unexpected muddling through to recovery. But on the pessimistic side, many of us might agree that seldom have so many severely negative potentials been out and about. Polycrisis may well be the word of the year. Should any one of these factors get out of control it might cause a severe global recession. One important factor is that the bursting of the global housing bubble, which is only just beginning, is likely to have a more painful economic knock-on effect than the decline in equities is having. For extreme bubble pricing in stocks has been confined to the US only. Other equity markets vary from fair price to normal or moderate overpricing. In real estate, by contrast, even though 2021's near 20% gain in US house prices, the largest annual gain in the record books, left the house price multiple of family income in the US at 6x up from 4.5x in 2011, according to Census Bureau data. That's above its previous record in 2006 at the height of the housing bubble, that ratio is still way below the 10x to 20x multiples in cities from Vancouver, London, and Paris to Shanghai, Sydney, and Taiwan. Housing busts seem to take two or three times longer than for equities, from 2006 for example it took six years in the US to reach a low and housing is more directly plugged into the economy than equities through construction starts and associated expenditures. Housing is also much more important for the middle class, whose wealth is often mainly in housing, who use far greater leverage through established, traditional mortgages than they ever do in stocks. And who are these days sitting on large gains resulting from 40 years of falling mortgage rates pushing up housing prices? Many of them see their houses as a major store of value and the bedrock of their retirement plans, and to see that value start to melt away will make them very nervous. Mortgage costs expand to fit the available affordability. Thus, as interest rates fall you take bigger mortgages because you can and as the mortgages grow in size house prices rise too. So don't mess with housing. But we have. And real estate markets that had come to be thought of as impregnable, Australia and Canada for example, have finally started to decline, with Canada down a shocking 13% last year. Other overpriced markets on mainly variable rates are very likely to follow.